God, I see that you are drawing Lying in the sand And I want to be standing on your side Holding your hand So let your spirit come Let it live in me This is my prayer This is my plea Community Church, United Church of Christ, and Charlie Hawks, our Minister of Music, and I warmly welcome you into this time of worship with each other and our amazing God, from one of our sacred spaces to one of your sacred spaces. God, I see that you are drawing, lying in the sand, and I want to be standing on your side, holding your hand, so let your spirit come, let it live in me, this is my prayer, this is my plea, the worship of the God. God, I hear 
as the saints of every nation are awakening to see from our hearts to cross an anthem. Oh, hear the heavens ring. This is a song. The song that we bring that the worshipers are Stop loving you. And love is the answer. I will walk you through it. I'll guide you through pulling those elements close to you, and we will walk through the worship together. And we will bless and consecrate the cup and the bread. And we will eat and drink and celebrate God's love for us all.
Sitting or standing, hear now a reading from the Gospel according to Luke, which reveals the proclamation of John the Baptizer in the baptism of Jesus. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Eteria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. Whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let us pray. Amazing God, be in our heads and in our thinking. Be in my voice and in my speaking. Be in our hearts and in our loving. Speak through me or in spite of me for the benefit of your holy word. Amen. If we have learned anything over the last four years, I think it is that we are not as good as we think we are. We have been torn apart by political divisions and culture wars, calls for justice rising up in the Black Lives Matter, the Me Too, the Green, and Indigenous Rights Movements, just to name a few, shed light on the ugly truth that our world is more often than not anything but righteous and just. And while difficult, the age-old problems of hunger and poverty and homelessness, the plight of the marginalized and the oppressed continue to weigh on our conscience. We are not as good as we think we are. We have been tested by the dual pandemics of racial injustice, acts of violence against people of color, and COVID-19. We have been challenged by the emergence of white supremacy and systemic racism in ways that can no longer be denied. Well, this is nothing new for people of color. Yet for many white people, this is the first time a national conversation and re- on race and justice has drawn our attention. 
I am moved by the words of Tracy Blackman, the Associate General Minister of Justice and Local Church Ministries for the United Church of Christ, when speaking to the Epiphany Insurrection posted on Facebook, white people not being treated like black people should not be a, rev a revelation to anyone globally. If this is news to you, you are part of the problem, no matter your intentions. We are not as good as we think we are. I, look at social media. You can easily see that we are, as a society, tearing each other apart. Often it feels like an apocalypse. Most certainly this week, the end of democracy, the end of our civil society, the end of the world. I believe all of these things beg us to follow what Jesus called the greatest commandment. In the 12th chapter of the Gospel, according to Mark, we are told that Jesus is in Jerusalem teaching. At this point in the Gospel, we find a long list of parables recorded, and Jesus is talking about all sorts of hot-button issues, such as greed and corruption, taxes, marriage, the afterlife, the identity of the Messiah, and how God wants us expects us, commands us, to share what we have with others regardless of how much or how little we may have. No one gets a free pass. Everyone is held accountable. In the middle of all of this, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, and he asks Jesus, of all the commandments, which one is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And there it is. This, the greatest commandment, is Jesus' one thing, right? It's his mantra, his mission statement, the reason why he gets up in the morning to live another day. Everything Jesus says and does is filtered through the lens of love for God, self, and others. As citizens of the kingdom of God, we are called to do the same. I could preach this sermon every Sunday forever, and it would always be enough. But we need to go deeper than that today. We need to ask ourselves, what does this love for God, self, and others look like in our lives? We desperately need to know these things because we are not as good as we think we are. And that's where our baptism comes in. There are layers of hidden wisdom in our text today from the third chapter of Luke, the baptism of Jesus. And I want us to focus on one of those many layers as I encourage you to go back and read the third chapter of Luke and listen for the still, small voice of God speaking to you. In this text, John comes across an ang comes across as an angry man speaking about an angry God. Where Jesus later in his ministry would proclaim a gospel of love, here John is proclaiming a gospel of judgment. Here John speaks in terms that compare and align the powers of God to the powers of Rome. The only difference being that the power of God is stronger than the powers of humanity. It's the kingdom of God versus the kingdoms of earth. In both cases, might equals right, and power is absolute. The powers of life and death are controlled by whom is doing the judging, which in this case is either Rome or God. He calls them out 
The people gathered at the river listening to him preach as a brood of vipers. He accuses them of coming to him to be baptized in the river so that they can escape the very wrath of God, a judging and punishing God that John is preaching about. He tells them it's not the ritual baptism itself that will save them, but whether they will bear fruits worthy of repentance. We see this in verses 7 and 8. Then John goes even farther. He tells them that they need God, but God doesn't need them. John tells them it doesn't matter who you are or who your family is. Your identity and reputation do not protect you from the judgment and wrath of God. Then John goes even further. He tells them that all the people are like trees and those that do not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the unquenchable fire. We see this in verses 8 and 9. John tells the people gathered at the River Jordan that they are not as good as they think they are. This scares the people gathered. So they ask John, what do we do? And here John gives them several examples of what it looks like when we bear the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. The fruits of the Spirit that carry the power to save ourselves from being cut down and thrown into the fire of a punishing and judging God. A God that wields the powers of Rome, but stronger. John says to everyone, You want to know what to do? Okay, let me lay this one on you. Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. When someone is in need, we are not allowed to look the other way. We are called to help them, to care for them, to share with them so that they will not have need. Caring for people who are in need bears fruit of the Spirit. But then the tax collectors come forward, and you know, tax collectors are notoriously greedy and corrupt in the time of Jesus. The people who collect the taxes for the Roman Empire are a terrifying expression of Roman power. A tax collector could make your family homeless or take all of the grain and livestock so that the family risked starvation, taking more than they need to line the pockets of both Rome and themselves. They wonder, can even I, a despised tax collector, bear the fruit of the Spirit and escape the wrath of God? And John tells them, let me tell you, sure, why not? Collect no more than the amount prescribed to you. John is calling on them to be fair and just, not greedy and corrupt. Fairness and justice are fruits of the Spirit. Then the soldiers came forward. Soldiers are the keepers of the peace, and they have the power of Rome, the powers of earth behind them that affords them a lot of privilege. Soldiers, like the tax collectors, swear an allegiance to Rome above all else. The soldiers swear that they shall faithfully execute all that the emperor commands, and they shall never desert the service, and that they shall not seek to avoid death for the Roman Republic. Their commitment was absolute to an emperor who was seen as a living God. The soldiers are the hands and feet of Caesar, rendering his judgment on all living things under control of the Roman Empire. But here on the banks of the River Jordan, even the soldiers wonder, can even I, a despised Roman soldier, bear the fruit of the Spirit and escape the wrath of God? And John tells them, sure you can. Just don't extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. John is calling them to refrain from intimidation and lies, which is ironic in telling. 
as many critical of the Roman soldiers would say that their power relies on intimidation to protect and promote the lies of the Roman Empire. Nonetheless, refraining from intimidation and bearing false witness are not bearing fruits of the Spirit. You need to refrain from intimidation and bearing false witness to bear those particular fruits. But when you look at the greatest commandment as defined by Jesus and the angry God of John the baptizer, we most certainly see a difference. Where Jesus looks at everything through a lens of love, inspired by the kingdom of heaven, John looks at everything through a lens of judgment, inspired by the kingdoms of earth. And I believe John is part right and part wrong here, and that the Holy Spirit backs me up on this. Few symbols represent Rome as powerfully as the eagle. Perched atop the legionary standard, its wings outstretched, this ferocious hunting bird represented the span of the Roman Empire. Eagles are large, powerfully built birds of prey with heavy heads and beaks. Most eagles are larger than any other rap raptors, apart from some vultures. Like all birds of prey, the eagles have large hooked beaks for ripping flesh from their prey, strong muscular legs, and powerful talons. Eagles are extremely violent and powerful. The eagle is a bird of power, violence, and death. In response to John's proclamation of an angry God of power and might, the gospel offers us this. In the 21st and 22nd verses of our reading, now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. Did you catch that? The Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. Not an eagle, but a dove. Not even something more powerful than an eagle, like a vulture, but a dove. The symbolism is written into the text itself. A massive spiritual and political statement that turns everything John has proclaimed upside down. The power of God is not like the Roman eagle, the power of death and terror. The power of God is like a dove, a symbol of new life and peace. So John gets the fruits of the Spirit right, I believe. John teaches that in order to bear the fruits of the Spirit, we must share with others in need to be fair and just, to never intimidate or bear false witness against our neighbors. What John gets wrong is his understanding of the power of God. The power of God is not anything like the powers of Rome. The power of God is revealed when we bear the fruits of the Spirit, and even the tax collectors and Roman soldiers among us are welcomed into the family of God who bear the fruits of the Spirit. A dear friend of mine, an unofficial member of Holy Trinity for many years before she passed, Phyllis Tickle, a religious publisher, author, poet, public theologian, mother of the emergent church movement, once said, the greatest test for any Christian is to live your life in such a way that just by looking at you, people will see that you are a member of the kingdom of God. I admit, in these dark days, I don't have all the answers. There is so much work to be done. These are dark and perilous times. But I can tell you this. 
The world is starving for the fruits of the Spirit. I saw that in Washington last week. The world is in desperate need of people who are willing to share what they have with others who need those things, like food, clothing, a place to live, health care, financial and physical security, and family. Yes, I am saying that we are even called to share our families with those who have none. The fruits of the Spirit will carry the power to change your life. The fruits of the Spirit carry the power to save your life, to save our nation, to save our society, to save the world. Remember this. The power of God is not the power of hate and terror and lies. It never has been and it never will be. That's just another lie that people who try to use God for their own benefit tell us. The power of God is the power of love. And if there is no love, there is no God in what you do. And God loves all of us, our friends and our enemies, the people we like and the people we don't, the people we want to help and the people we judge and don't want to help. God loves us all, regular people, irregular people, tax collectors, soldiers, terrorists, protesters. It's hard, but it's for all of us. God will never stop loving us. No one of us, no earthly power, has the ability to deny God's love for anyone. No one can take God's love away from you, and nor can you take God's love away from anyone else. And this doesn't condone the actions of others with a blank slate. No, 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 no. Like Jesus teaching in the temple in the third chapter of Luke, all are held accountable for their actions. But we must remember that love is always the answer for a follower of the way the truth, and the light. Love will win. So now, on this baptism of Christ Sunday, I ask you, as John asked them thousands of years ago, repent for your sins. What have you done that makes you complicit in where our society is at now? I know, I know so easy to go, those people over there are doing this, and those people over there are doing that. And frankly, there are people who are right and wrong in a million different ways. It's all about context. But really? If we're looking at the Green Movement and the Me Too Movement and Black Lives Matter and the COVID-19 pandemic and everything that that has ex ex exposed, the blazing fire of systemic racism and white privilege and the violence against black bodies and black trans bodies and children and human trafficking. And when we look at all of that, we cannot say no one of us can say that we are not responsible. No one of us can say that we haven't played a part in it for good or for evil. And usually it's a little bit of both. The negativity and the emotions coursing through our public consciousness just seem so toxic. And the only way I believe for us to truly find our way out of this darkness and back into the light of a glorious God-given day is to remember that we are called to bear the fruits of the Spirit. I would say as revealed in Luke chapter 3, where John is preaching. I don't believe in God, in John's version of an angry, punishing God. I, I simply don't. If you do... More power to you, but I don't. 
But I do believe in the power of the fruits of the Spirit that reveal the love of God, the kingdom of God on earth, of justice and peace, where true power is not that of a screeching war eagle. True power is revealed by a dove that is gentle and kind, as is a symbol of new life. So, reflect, repent, and then go and make it so. Grace and peace to you from God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. Taking me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you. I need you. My world may fall, I will never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. Jesus, lover of my soul. for us to come together in a time of prayer. We invite you now while watching this broadcast to enter in the comment section the reason for your prayer, understanding that this is a public forum and confidentiality must be held. Don't share anybody else's business. Maybe say for a friend who is sick, for someone who is traveling, for someone I love, for healing, for peace. Maybe you have blessings that you would like to share in prayer, such as making it through another day or another week or for our nation and the divided society we live in. You know why we pray every week? Because the power of God is real and the power of prayer is real. And yet, it is a mystery. 
Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen at all? I mean, if there's a God, shouldn't God stop it? Critics say that all the time. But people who live a life of faith bear witness to their experiences with their relationships with God and each other. And they say, yeah, you know, bad things happen to good people all the time. But the true power of God for us has not been revealed in this Santa Claus God that waves a magic wand and fixes everything or keeps bad things from happening to anyone ever. That's not the God we know. The God we know and the power of God we experience is where no matter what we are going through, no matter what happens to us, we are never alone. Our God and our faith is always with us every step of the way, no matter how dark or how light, no matter how short or how long, no matter how deep or how high, we are always with God. God is always with us. And when we reflect on how the power of God has moved in our lives and we bear witness, we proclaim that God has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So while a mystery, a mystery that we cannot pretend to understand fully or control, the power of God is real, and the power of prayer is real. Hallelujah. So join us now in this time of prayer with each other and our amazing God. Amazing God, we come to you today and we lift up our nation who is suffering and in pain. Lord, bring us the ability to call each other in instead of calling each other out. To be able to come together in some holy and sacred way that we may not be able to see at this present time open the door to a new age of healing for our nation, for our government, for our leaders. Lord, help us to not look towards the Roman eagle, but the godly dove, as the inspiration for your power at work in our lives. Lord, we pray for our states, and we pray for our cities, both red and and blue. We pray for members of all political parties. We pray for the entire planet and all of the humans upon it. All of the earthlings, the animals, the insects, the birds of the air, all of the living things, the grass and the wheat, the mountains and the oceans. Help us, Lord, to find our way. Help us, Lord, to stop and reflect on who we are and what we stand for so that we may become a part of the solution. Lord, where we are broken, bring us healing so we may bear fruits of the Spirit to bring about the kingdom of God, heaven on earth. Lord, there are so many prayers in this virtual room, spoken and unspoken, texted and held in the heart. Receive all of these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus our Christ. Lord, we lift up prayers for travel mercies. We lift up prayers for those suffering with COVID-19 and those who love them. We lift up our first responders, our doctors, our nurses, the people in the hospitals and the grocery stores who care for our sick and who keep our society going. Lord, we pray for our government at all of its levels, national, state, and local, and all of our leaders, regardless of who they are, that you may touch their hearts and open them to receive your kindness and your joy so they may be able to bear the fruit of the Spirit as well. We ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus our Christ. Amen.
We all have different gifts and graces, don't we? Playing the piano is not one of mine, but it is an extraordinary gift of our Minister of Music, Charlie Hawks, who blesses us with his talent and his passion for the gospel and the gifts that God has given him that you can easily tell when you hear him play, he treats as a treasure, as a gift that he shares with others. Following our theme of bearing fruits of the Spirit, I would offer that what Charlie does is he shares music with people who may have none in their life. And that is a fruit of the Spirit. Christ. In the same way, and your gifts, your financial support, for the ministries and mission here at Holy Trinity Community Church is essential for us to continue being a teaching church, to teach the next generation of ordained and lay leaders alike to lead the church in proclaiming the power of the gospel, the power of the dove over and against the power of the war eagle. In our communities, in our state, in our nation, and in our world. There are three different ways by which you may support the financial health and wellness here at Holy Trinity Community Church, United Church of Christ. You will find them on your screen now. The first way is by using Cash App. Our name on Cash App is dollar sign, Holy Trinity Memphis, all one word. The second way is by going to our website, holytrinitymemphis.org, and clicking on the word give in the upper left-hand corner. And the third way is by simply sending a payment, a gift, a tithe, an offering, in an envelope to our post office box. And one of our treasurers will pick it up, deposit it. Your giving, your financial support has been incredible, and I want to thank you for that. Do we have a bunch of extra money so that we can do whatever we want? No. <laughs> and I'm glad we don't, frankly. I don't think that any church deserves to be wealthy or rich. I just don't. But you know, we do find a way to have enough and work with what we got. You give what you can, and we do what we can with it. This has been a partnership for over 30 years here at Holy Trinity. You commit to giving what you can, what you feel call, God is calling you to give, and then we commit to doing what we can with it, to break chains and shake prisons and save lives, to let the gospel of Jesus Christ and the love of God flow through all of us, to do just that and nothing less. So please consider supporting Holy Trinity financially today. And thank you for your steadfast and loyal support. Oh, oh, oh. 
celebrate the sacrament of communion. If you have set aside something to eat and something to drink, now is the time in the service to pull that close to you so that you have access to it when you need it. Let us now enter into a time of celebrating the holy sacrament of communion. We come to the table not just as individuals, but as a community. By sharing the bread and the cup, Christ makes us one with Christ and each other. Just as we are nourished by the food we eat, Christ nourishes us spiritually at this table with the bread of life and the cup of blessing. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, freely offering your love, mercy, and grace when we fail you, ourselves, and each other. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who came as the light of the world to show us your way of truth in parables and miracles. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to our amazing God, that our chain-breaking, prison-shaking, life-saving Savior, Jesus Christ, before he suffered, gave us this memorial of his sacrifice until he comes again. 
At his last supper, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the death of Jesus until Christ comes again. Therefore, we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this sacrament. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. O Divine Beloved, send your Holy Spirit so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we and all your saints be united with Christ and remain faithful in hope and love. Gather your whole family, O God, into the glory of your kingdom. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Gather what you have set aside, take what you have to eat, and eat. Gather what you have set aside to drink, and drink. Join me in our prayer after communion. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now is the time for us to offer a special blessing. If you have had a birthday or an anniversary or a significant life event and would like to receive this special blessing from the congregation, we invite you to enter the reason for your blessing in the comment section to this worship service and to stand as you are able now. Today, we praise God for our birthdays and our anniversaries and our significant life events. For all the good things that come into our lives, not by our power, but by God's power and providence. May the power of God, the dove of peace and new life, always reign supreme over the eagles that try to terrorize all of us. May Christ, whose resurrection brings new hope and a new future, fill you with new life and the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one mother of us all, be with you and remain with you always. Know that God loves you. God has always loved you. God will never stop loving you. And love is the answer. Let us love one another as we walk together through these difficult days, knowing that amidst neighbor, helping neighbor, we will find the holy and healing presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Lifting me up, I 
Oh